So we have a few questions uh, coming. I'm sure there will, there will be more. Um, Suresh took a couple earlier, but um, uh, let's see. Let's pick one at, at random here. Um, thank you. Do we have any approved tool in the current situation where, uh, which collaborates in the system of engagement, system of records area? So, uh, as I mentioned, the vendor certification program is yet not launched. So, there are, there are no tools which are certified with IT for IT as of today. What do you think would be the roadmap for moving from traditional to fully automated IT for IT? And what are the, what are the intermediate transitional stages that can be achieved to show progress and get more support? First, let's take uh, the concept of iterative application, right? Uh, you can't eat an elephant in one bite. You've got to eat it one step at a time, right? So if you're going to be making this transition, uh, I think what really is a benefit of IT for IT, and in fact it is stated so, is that you can do parts, right? And the part that is going to give you most value is the one that you should do first, right? So you, it's, it's just like any agile model, right? If you, you don't want to start with the roof, you want to start with the foundation. So I think that the best way to go about it is, is to look at the value streams, because the concept of Potter, when you say that there are multiple value streams, what is the concept? The concept is that each value stream is going to add some value and pass it on to the next value stream. So as the value keeps adding, the end value becomes much larger, right? So one way in which you can decide where you want to start is to look at the value streams, right? Where do I want to get my value from? So for instance, uh, in some of the customer sites, uh, we found that the, uh, you know, for instance, what are you doing about request to fulfill, right? Uh, I'll be talking a little later about a service, you know, a CIO organization versus a service provider organization. There are some things which are under our control, some things which are not under our control. So the question also matters is whether you're asking it from a CIO organization viewpoint or from a service provider organization viewpoint, right? Uh, in any of these cases, I think that if you're really looking at where your real pain areas are and which stream you really want to address that core problem, you can do that one step at a time. You can do it iteratively. You can take some components and say, look, I'm not, for instance, my service blueprint, right? Uh, many of you are from, uh, you know, service provider organizations. You go and take a hostile takeover of some application, right? An application service. Do you really get all the information? Right? Rarely, right? So, so when you then look at what is going to be your, and what is the job that you're really doing is R2F and because your service request and your incident and stuff which is in the detect to correct. So now the question is, who is going to give you that? document that IT for IT is talking about. It's called a service blueprint. Right? So, so you got to look at what you have, what you don't have, what's going to give you value. And, and because it's organized by value stream, I think it's a pretty straightforward decision. In any organizations we, we start, one of the things we need to be aware is there is already something existing in place, right? In terms of process, in terms of tools, in terms of compliance. So first, leverage the best of what is already existing. You know, you save a lot of time. We call it as value harvesting. You know, the, the moment you understand there is a wealth of information that already exists in your organization, let's leverage the best out of it, right? And then use and see how it fits into pieces. So many times we always think we get fascinated about new frameworks, methodology and standards, and we undermine ourselves in terms of what rich repository we build. So I would say that please do due diligence to the existing way things are working and try to fine tune before you even go and adopt something new. That's my uh, first point of approach. Of course, what Sukumar said was thing, but just another perspective as well. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, how does IT for IT impact uh, the EA discipline? Does this require a learning curve for architects or the ability to adopt and adapt to change? So I would say that IT for IT is the enterprise architecture for running IT. So if you look at the TOGAF definition, TOGAF says that you need an enterprise architecture for every business. 
So you have business, you have an enterprise architecture for a telecom business, for a healthcare business. Similarly, you need an enterprise architecture for IT, and IT for IT is the enterprise architecture for IT. <laughs> That's the way I would answer it. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think when you, uh, how many of you have done TOGAF, right? Many of you have, right? So what's a reference architecture? How many reference, huh, you read that in TOGAF passing exams, they say reference architecture arts, right? That is for, huh? then what is for, what is for telecom? So how do you use that when you use enterprise architecture? Is there a difference between ETOM and enterprise architecture? What is the connection, right? So what, the way I see it is that the enterprise architecture and the ADM gives us a methodology, right? which gives us certain standard approaches, certain set of documents, certain policies, methodologies that you need to follow, right? It doesn't tell you what to do. So you use ETOM for this thing, you use IT for IT for IT service management enterprise. It's as simple as that. Okay, thank you. Um, how do you see IT for IT fitting to the agile model of execution? So I think uh, working with some of the organizations uh, across uh, different uh, uh, continents, one of the things is, you know, everybody asks, uh, the first thing is, okay, we have now moved away from the waterfall to agile, you know, how does IT for IT things? And I think Steve mentioned about a white paper coming across. But then if you look at really understanding, um, in terms of agility, in terms of how you, you run your sprints, and how you actually look at your sprint backlog, your product backlog to the time that you have that iterative improvements, right? The minimum viable product that we're talking about. It all boils down to actually talking about value, right? So if you look at the underlying principle of Agile is to come up with iterative minimum viable product that gives them a kind of it. And the aspect of use case is again relevant here in terms of IT for IT value stream. So there's a strong cohesive energy between what you're talking about as kind of user stories as part of use case here in IT for IT. And also from the point that you're saying is you have to deliver value as part of your existing sprint. That again gets applied in the context that what value chain are you going to focus currently? S2P, R2F, whatever. And see what will be the outcome for that particular value stream in what duration and stuff. So it's kind of already blended nicely into that kind of model. When we talk agile, I think it's just multiple waterfalls. Okay, You just do them close together. So, whether the model is agile or it is this thing, the idea is to deliver value which you can see. Because we're talking a lot about flexibility and speed to market, right? So, what they're talking about also is that the way you're going to be building products is going to change, right? Today, what happens is that you have a business strategy that then throws some requirement over the wall and then IT creates a strategy document, right? And then you take the money and you spend the million dollars and then you go and give a UAT which nobody accepts, right? So whereas when you're talking about the methodology they're talking about here is prototyping, incubation, it is much more than just agile, right? Agile is building the whole product. Maybe you won't need the whole thing. Maybe what is it that you're trying to do, right? So this kind of long drawn out like what she was saying earlier, Lakshmi is saying, two, I'll give you two rollouts. No, 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 no point. Otherwise, my customer is gone. Because somebody else comes with an app and takes him away, right? So we need to get something out there as quickly as possible because there's a big threat to CIO organizations. The threat is the business is not going to come to you. Business will go to somebody else directly get the sum because they want to run their business, right? So that is why Agile is very important. Basically, it means multiple waterfalls in short spans. So... Cost of poor quality, you find the error closer to the source, cheaper. So you do agile, you do multiple releases. If you don't like it, throw it, get the next release, out, which is where I think it works. There was another additional. I need a clarification on that point. So uh, in the reference architecture 2.0, where do we see the agile, agile is something which is fitting inside? Because uh, we have something like, like uh, project management component inside. But uh, do we, uh, it does not really prescribe how do we achieve the agility uh, inside the framework? Uh, if you see that, I mean, 
uh, when you say agile, are we losing ourselves in some, uh, you know, lingua franca kind of a story? Or are we saying that, you know, agile doesn't require builds, agile doesn't require quality check, agile doesn't require testing, are we saying that? No. Then, then everything is there. It's only that your major project, if it's a two-year project, it's not agile. Right? Okay. If it's a two-week so, delivery, it becomes agile. <laughs> So it is like inherently all the uh, 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 entire framework, why, uh, how it is integrated to each other is something which is achieving the agility, isn't it? Yes, okay. precisely. Right? Sure. Because Thank what's you. happening is that in this case, for instance, your strategy to portfolio is going to determine what is going to see, because you have to look at the capability increment story of open group. Right? You're not building a solution, you're building an organizational capability. So with every release, if you're releasing a new capability, then you're agile. Right, thank you. Question uh, initially for Laxmi, how do you define small, medium and large IT organizations? I would say that if I say a large, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> a large IT organization, it would have a budget of upwards of a billion dollars. So an organization like Shell, which is a budget of IT budget of five billion dollars. So yeah, so large IT organizations, I would define as upwards of one billion, but that's my assessment. Any other comments from me? <laughs> yeah. I would also look at uh, different dimensions. Obviously, the dollar value makes a difference, but also in terms of your geographical spread and in terms of the volume of people. It could be IBM, it could be HP or whatever, right? So, the geographical presence and the kind of widespread that we do could also be a way of looking at large enterprises. You know. So, thank you. Question around ITIL. Um, there's a concern in the ITIL community on the introduction of IT for IT. How are we integrating with IT, IT, uh, ITIL subscribers? Are there any case studies where ITIL and IT for IT work together at this stage? So I can probably attend because I've been closely watching what's happening around the ITIL. I know if, if anybody knows that there is an ITIL practitioner that is launched and that's, uh, that's coming up on 25th February, which is a live webcast, I'm also speaking on that. Now, if you look at it, um, there is already a post. If you, if you are in uh, Facebook, join. Uh, back to ITSM group where there Charles has already posted a clear definition of how IT for IT and ITIL can be complementing each other. So I would strongly recommend you to go through that things or if you could just connect with me, I can do. But if you look at uh, primarily uh, ITIL, as, we, as, as Lakshmi really pointed out, it's a process centric approach, right? We are talking about all of those 25, 26 processes in silos. And of course, it's talking about a service life cycle more from an abstract terminology. There is no definition of a prescriptive guidance. We have lacked heavily on ITIL because it did not have any prescriptive guidance. But if you look at IT for IT, uh, the level of prescriptiveness, you know, from the models that we have talked about makes more tangible. So I think uh, you should look at ITIL being as complementing but not, you know, IT for IT has got a broader umbrella of what it does, you know, over and above what ITIL operates. So, she rightly said about enterprise architecture and other stuff. So ITIL is just one piece of process stream. But there is another stream that we all talk about in delivering value. So, but I would, I would strongly agree that there's a lot of work to be done in order to come up. With. So let's not try to mimic IT for IT uh, and then get ITIL go there. So it, it's, it's not just adding value. Uh, I think there is a huge difference between a reference architecture and a library, right? Uh, I don't think we should compare the two, first of all, right? Uh, but, but the market being what it is, ITIL has been sold as a standard, right, which you become compliant to, which I never believed, right. Uh, so, but having said that, it's not that I'm against ITIL, but if you look at what actually the, the IT for IT is doing, is that what they are saying is that each of those components that you saw, those blue boxes, they are saying that is the minimum piece of technology that you need. It is basically something like a, each of those components, for instance, when they say incident management component, right, they are talking about what is going to be the incident ticket data, right. Now, what ITIL is teaching you is the stuff which is connected to that. In fact, I will be showing you some stuff in the afternoon about that because there is a data component which, for instance, is your remedy tool or whatever. Remedy is not incident management, right, but remedy has an incident ticket or CA or whatever product, right? 
So when we are talking about a component, a data object or a technology component, we are talking about the ticket data and how it is going to be moved or whatever. Right? The process which is going to operate that function, IT for IT is kept out of scope. Right? But they've given you scenarios, they've given you guidance on what could be those processes and how those could be evaluated. So for instance, if you take ideas from IT for ITIL or from COBIT or, or from any of these models, you still need the data model, right? Which is why the reference architecture stands. It doesn't matter what standard you're doing, what approach you're doing. Also, whether IBM is following some uh, incident management process, somebody else is following something else, right? What is the commonality? It is a data component, right? So that is what IT is talking about, and I think all this talk about comparing ITIL and COBIT and all that, it's not a comparison. They co-inhabit, is what my opinion is. I agree. Anything to add? No. I, I, I would add that certainly the ITSMF community that, uh, that I've experienced so far since we introduced IT for IT has been not so much threatened or, or concerned, but, but rubbing their hands thinking, great, this is something, uh, this is something else, and they're a big part of that community. So uh, I think um, uh, there may be some concern, but I think there's also uh, uh, great uh, excitement too. Um, next question. Um, for an organization which uses third-party tools for IT, what should an approach be for implementing IT for IT? Any suggestions? So I think if they're already using third-party tools, unless the tools don't get vendor certified, they, they won't be able to implement IT for IT completely. But for new services that they're developing, like I said, they can take an approach wherein they can, they can put a requirement in the RFP saying that the vendor management, the tools that you come in with sh should be IT for IT certified. So it will be more of a step approach for, for organizations which are already using third party tools because unless they don't, unless the tools don't get certified, it will be difficult. So they can start off for new services that they put there in the RFP that, okay, for me, this is one of my requirement to be able to uh, qualify you. So that way, they'll be moving slowly. They'll take a step approach to move towards IT for IT. Yeah. yeah. Any other observation? Yeah. And to that, to that point, one of the things we heard um, at the last open group conference in San Francisco was a representative from Microsoft saying that um, he couldn't even begin to explain the number of calls since it was launched from their account teams uh, with customers asking for IT for IT to be used in their service provision. So I think as word gets out to customers, it will become part of, as you say, RFPs. And, and if the customers ask for it, then uh, the providers will, uh, will provide it. We'll, we'll have to. Uh, next question. How do support functions like HR and finance fit into the reference arch architecture? So I think as far as finance goes, it plays a very important role because finance is basically about, as I mentioned, it is about the investments that IT should make, determining the total cost of ownership of a service and determining what is the price point for, uh, for, uh, for IT to provide any services to business. So I would say that finance plays a very crucial play, uh, part to ensure that IT runs like a business. Because unless the CIO is able to determine the total cost of ownership of a service, he won't be able to price it. Or he, won't, he or she won't be able to say that, okay, this is the value, or this is the money that I'm spending and this is the value that I'm returning in return. So finance from that perspective becomes very important. And HR... Well, so, so I'll just add on what you think. So if you look at the, the entire IT for IT reference architecture, we did talk about value streams, but you also miss the supporting services. So if you look at supporting services, there is governance, there is actually, you know, financial services, as well as, you know, there is also something called as resource and project management. So if you look at it, these are supporting services are integral for any projects and business that you do it. I mean, they cannot be a certain. For example, HR, you're talking about resourcing of people, talent, to actually deliver some products or services, right? What if you don't get thing, people on time? The resource is not being deployed on time. They don't have capability in terms of skill development. You cannot deliver a product or service which is delivering value. So
So you look at this, and I just touched upon in my case study as well, that HR, finance, these are horizontal functions, right? They cut across entire value chain. And if something gets stopped, the entire value chain gets broken. So you just not just look at very IT-centric, and, and that's the part of our bigger problem. We always focus towards the IT value chain, but then it's the enterprise value chain that we need to think about. Am I, am I getting the right talent, the right staff, deployed at the right place to deliver value, right? Be it an agile project. Many times we have problems that people say that, you know, I cannot pull this guy from another project because he already built. But if you're an agile organization, so how do you get a kind of a talent pool that is actually able to fit in on demand, on business? So I think you have to look at from that aspect that these functions, horizontal functions, which are critical supporting services to, uh, to enable that value chain and deliver business value. So, uh, Suresh, thanks for that clarification here. Um, just wanted to add, uh, I, I, just, uh, I see, uh, you know, the value chain is kind of uh, mentioning all the supporting uh, functions, but it, it, when we talk about um, uh, a reference architecture or a value uh, streams, it does not really talk about any support functions uh, like, you know, finance or HR or any other supporting functions that we have seen in the value chain system. So do we have... Uh, I'll just add to one and give it to Lakshmi. So one of the things what she was telling also is, you know, there's not much of work done as of in terms of supporting services. You know, Accenture is starting to develop from an IT financial service model, service model, service-based costing and other stuff. So, and as you know, we have just launched and we just, it is evolving. One of the things that we need to contribute back, you know, of course, we are consuming a lot from the open group, is to also come up with that kind of suggestions because you have practically facing that kind of brunt and give th gives those perspectives you know, with the, as an open group member and contribute to that kind of discussion. Because as a team, one of the things that I love about IT for IT is just because it's a collective mindshare. It's not talking about ownership of HPs or IBMs or Accenture's of the world. It is a collective mindshare where people have come in for a common purpose to achieve things. So I think you should start contributing to that piece and just to add uh, you know, your discussion. We have not still fully developed at that level of supporting services. Um, next question. Given the fact that the pace of change is rapid these days, um, more so now than ever, both on the business side and the IT side, how can one ensure that the two parties still sync up and generate value together? In last yeah, how can you uh, ensure that the two parties, business and IT, sync up and generate value together? Ah. With everything <laughs> moving so fast. Yes. Uh, I'll be talking more about this later. But I don't think there's any more choice in this matter, right? Because I think if you, I'll show you some statistics, right? Already some 35 to 38 percent of budgetary control has moved out of IT, right? So what are you talking about aligning to your business? If you don't align, you're gone, right? They're going to take somebody from outside, right? We're all running repair shops. So what we're really talking about is if we want to be participant in the strategy, uh, tell me, when was the last time you improved your customer's business? Right? If you're in telecom, for instance, have you reduced the number of bad bills? It comes and goes, eh? right? So, if the question here is, what is the value you're going to deliver, right? And so, what if you don't do that, so that's what we're talking about in the, in the IT variety, you'll see a lot of this mention saying broker, right? It's no longer husband and wife. Eh? I don't think so. I'm very sorry. <laughs> I think a broker, consumer and seller relationship is different from husband and wife. Stand as a middleman and blow a whistle on both sides. Right? That is the role that's going to happen. Right? You look at it yourself from a CIO organization. Right? We'll discuss this more, but this is what I feel is going to happen. And I would just like to add that if you see more and more businesses are using digital platforms, right? They're moving to digital platforms. So business strategy and IT strategy over a period of time is going to converge. They're not going to be separate things because the, the, the business models are based upon digital platforms or on digital ecosystems. So business and IT strategy will be one. There's, there's no choice. The CIO otherwise will disappear. So, yeah. Thank you. Next one. Uh, do you see IT for IT as a top-down or a bottom-up approach? 
it depends upon the organization so i talked about both the approaches like if we talk about shell which is a very large organization which bought into it for it it sees the value that it for it provides they've used a top down approach a smaller organization who wants to test waters before they implement it for it they could do a sort of a bottom up so the approach that i mentioned that for new services they could ensure that it for it is ingrained as a part of that and then move bottom up so it would depend upon the kind of organization and their buy in into it for it yeah i just wanted to just add because what's happening is you know the the thing that works in most of the organization is only bottom up but the reason behind is not many companies like shell have the understanding of what's happening around in the open group and value so it's easy for us to start with something and show some quick wins you know as part of detect to correct where you're already doing kind of operations see the kind of value that you bring in terms of you know what he said you know in terms of billing rate you know the false billing and other stuff getting down and saying people are more happier and kind of stuff and then say can we move up the value stream from detect to correct to move on to request to fulfill and then move on right so that means people have seen something happening concrete on the ground in reality perspective that can take them the kind of momentum to build across to to wider adoption of uh, it for it moving up that's my way of looking at it okay all right thank you um let's see uh somewhat related i guess um how does it for it fit with the cxo board in a company where's the where does it fit there's a there's a picture drawn on the question actually of ceo cio cto thank you cfo coo and cmo with it for it in the middle is that how you see it you could actually ask the person to actually make the we'll have to give up <laughs> yeah so he's able to visualize that so. that's that's right yeah so i don't know who asked who who did ask the question but that, is is that where it fits but how does how is it for it aligned with the cxo board in the company yeah okay uh, i think it starts with a strategy to portfolio right uh, because you take a business strategy today everybody is frightened right business people because somebody with a credit card and a bright idea can go and buy you know free i mean go and start with a small amount of money and then if the app runs and then suddenly you're out of business right so when you're looking at it i think the cxos have to now become it savvy right we've all i used to talk 10 years ago that you know business talks hindi uh, you know software talk developers talk telugu and uh, support talks tamil nobody talks to each other and all that right but it's all gone now right today my grandfather also swipes in those days when i put machine in front of my you know cxo he just kept it there to show his somebody visiting him that he's got a computer on his table he didn't even do his own email right he'll still call the stenographer and dictate whereas today everybody right is using swipe right so what is happening is that he the cxo is talking to another cxo that fellow is showing off see what my app can do so now who is going to be deciding what they want so the story here is that the entire thing is changed before you talk this is what my business needed and then you've got this huge technology guy coming and telling you how to do things right but now the cxo is going to come and say my my competition is doing that what are you doing so i think that the strategy to portfolio is where the business connection is going to take place and the broker mode really means that right that the business is saying look how are we going to beat everybody else or before somebody comes and takes it away from us right so there is a huge role for the cxo aspect but that is going to be and that is why if you see in the uh, in your s2p it starts with the first box is enterprise architecture right so those guys are going to connect up people are going to talk about what is value right and if you see what is the what is the conceptual model what is it it is what am i going to do when am i going to do and how much money am i going to save and what's it going to deliver to my company that is a conceptual model can you build a conceptual model for business strategy without cxo right so that is where the building of the conceptual model and ensuring that the conceptual model talks about what the business needs i think that is where the cxos are going to participate i just want to add uh, a couple of things so if you look at the org structure typically you have a ceo and you have a cio who's reporting to the ceo let's say 
and CAO now has someone called a CTO. Now the CTO either could be on parallel and reporting directly to CEO, but most of them what happens is CAO owns the baton and says, Chief Technology Officer, come and tell me what is the kind of projects in technology innovation that we need to opt for. Earlier, CAO's role was numbered at least for three years. Now it's actually the, the, the benefit of Dow is, is one year. So CAOs are an increasing pressure to demonstrate why they are different. So what happens? The new CAO comes in, he, he wipes out the previous strategy what was existing and comes something revolutionary. That's happening because everybody wants to prove that they can elongate their period from one year to three years. So that's many of the times we need to think that, you know, everybody wants to save their own seats in order to do that. Let's be very honest. Coming about with business and value is the second part. I am playing a role of CIO. Can I exist in this position for the next three years? So I think there is a fundamental shift happening where the CEO just decides whether you're actually trying to align which is relevant to business or are you looking at, looking at something which you are having uh, to own from that. So that's a shift that is happening off late and that's going to change the way CXOs are going to be much more demanding in nature. He needs digital, he needs IT because there are digital ecosystems everywhere. So IT has become very important for the CEO to run his business. And unless IT demonstrates the value, uh, 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 it, it is very difficult for the, CIO, for the CIO to sustain. So that's why CEO and CIO need to basically uh, work together to ensure that the value is provided here. Yeah. Uh, Suresh, uh, related to that question, uh, the question, okay, why we are having the two roles, CIO and CTO? Okay, that's a good question, but I cannot answer because it's the organization that has to answer. Yes. But if you look at it, typically, the CIO actually oversees all the initiatives of the IT, right? Technology is just one part of it. You still have process, you have people, you have skill development, capability development. So if you look at uh, one of the reasons, chief reasons CTO as a role emerged in the recent years is to catch up with the growing trends of bring your own device, IoT and other stuff. The, the CEO asks, hey guys, what are we doing now? Are we supposed to go on cloud or on virtualization or on best practice? Because the market is talking about it. Now the CEO is not expected to know something on latest of technology. However, he can have a peer who is technology driven, seen how the kind of market trend happens, what's the context of the organization, what is fit for the organization and starts getting that value. So I think there is an increasing importance of CTO today, primarily from the reason that we need to make sure that we are aligned from a competitive intelligence standpoint. CAO cannot do that justice because technology is so rapid, so agile in nature that he cannot catch up with that kind of speed. So you need to have dedicated marshal, I would say, who envisions the whole technology landscape in order to align with the business. Does it answer your question? Right. Okay, Thank Suresh you. and Lakshmi, I have a question here. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. <clears throat> We're so running out of time for questions. Two so. questions here. Yeah. Quick questions. And we're uh, trying to do it from the written questions, so please would you allow the process to continue? Um, otherwise we won't get to these, uh, to these questions. Uh, how do you estimate the cost involved in IT for IT transformation? And second part, how do you measure the success quantitatively? <laughs> so, uh, the cost involved in implementing IT for IT, it would d depend on the size of the organization, on the size of the IT organization and the, and the kind of landscape they have in place. The, it also depends on number of other factors like how many service providers are they using, uh, whether they build systems internally. So, it's, it's something which is very, very, it's very difficult to predict a number on what, 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 what is the kind of investment that's needed for IT for IT. Yeah. Uh, I suppose it's also what you want to do with IT for IT, right? Because there are many things that you can do with it, right? Uh, you can look at your existing products and say, look, are they following this particular flow? Is my data missing, right? So that's not going to cost you any money, right? So you can use the standard and start tomorrow. Right? What am I capturing? What are the things that I'm doing? Have I organized myself so well? Right? Now, if you're talking about implementing IT for IT, I think the lady also just now said that so far, no tool is still certified. Right? So therefore, it's also difficult to say what you're actually going to do with it. Right? 
So the point is IT for IT is not like your ISO 20,000 or something where you can say, because I don't believe in anybody can give a quote for implementing IT ILOs, right? But the point is that what you're really saying is IT for IT has got many different value outcomes depending on your approach, your need, your business plans, you know, your strategies, what you're trying to solve, right? So don't look at it as something that you're going to buy in the, you know, a shirt that you're going to buy and wear it and look nice immediately, right? It's not, it's not like that. Okay, thank you. IT for IT is very interesting, but is it convincing to the IT industry as yet? In other words, how will it affect IT if IT for IT is not adopted? I think that's a question that you will realize very soon. Yeah. Because the absence of doing something will become much evident when others in the competition is catching up. So the way to look at it is, you know, we can agree and decide of resistance to change because I guys don't see value. But if you look at the kind of market that we are in, if we, if we don't scale up our existing ones, we will be outsourced. And many people who have achieved something substantial have done as an early adopter. You don't have the full picture of what it is, but you have a reasonable idea and foundation that could help you to start with that. And that's the only way you can excel in terms of transformations or delivery. If you had everything on a piece of paper saying that this is how it is working, by the time you get to that level of clarity, you're already lost in the race. Many people would have gone much ahead of that terms because they would have actually experimented, failed, learned and then moved on. So if you ask this question, just wait for another six months and you will, you will come back with the answer of that. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's I think what that's I right. exactly wanted to say. that you will give that answer to us. Because once you start looking at IT for IT, and once you start implementing it, you'll know the value it provides. So we as, <laughs> we as the people who have developed it are, are not the right person to answer this. <laughs> yeah. would be a, I would just, sorry. I'm sorry, would there be a chance to talk about this, Stephen? I'm not sure of the time. To, is there a chance to? Is there a chance to ask the question? Uh, yeah, well, we're, we're going to, uh, is it related to this question or another but I question? Think, uh, the only thing I'd like to ask to clarify the question is, uh, you know, what is that distinctive advantage that IT for IT brings? And I think that's the question. And to your point, yes. it isn't true if you say in six months competitors are going to catch up. I wouldn't buy that for the simple reason that long before IT for IT ever came in, the talk of business and IT being aligned has been a published. Uh, aspect that has also been implemented in the absence of IT for IT. Sure. So it's not like IT for IT is going to be like, you know, something like a silver bullet that's going to give you today what the business has been pursuing all along. But there has to be something that is distinctive in its advantage. Yeah. And I think it's that which we really would like to yes. What I think, I think he's 100% right. There is no magic pill here, right? But there is something magically different. What is that? That is the value chain concept, right? That service is, you know, first of all, when I go and work with, with IT people, I tell them, define an IT service. What is the service you're providing? They will only tell me application name, right? I think the core thing starts with service orientation, right? It is the outside in concept, right? What is my business wanting to do, right? Today, what is happening is that there is a, clear divide between business and IT, right? What I think IT for IT is going to do is it's going to streamline this whole thing. Let's take a simple point, right? You know, uh, some people call it Christmas freeze. Some people, you know, every Christmas, nobody should do any changes, right? It happens in all your organizations. Huh? Why they tell you don't do change? Why? Because when you change, everything falls apart, right? So you don't touch anything, IT should not do anything, so IT will run well. <laughs> that is the concept of a freeze, no changes. Why is that? So I think what ITFIT can bring for us is a complete end-to-end -end value stream of saying, look, this is how things are connected. It's not that somebody is doing delivery, somebody is doing development, they will pass the UAT, give all the known errors to support who is fixing the problem. Right? How long is this going to continue? How long are you going to survive like this? 
right? Where you have to stop working so that no fault will happen in your IT. Just look at that, right? So I think that what we're really seeing is not about how I'm fixing things or how I'm doing things. It is a service orientation that we are talking about. Right? And the service supply chain, the service backbone, where everything is traceable from when the, what the business wanted, when, how delivered, to what is actually happening in the end. I think this end-to-end -end view is the difference that IT for IT is bringing in. So I do want to get to uh, this question, because uh, whoever asked it took a lot of time writing it out. Um, sort of multi-parts, it's take a scenario of company X offering multiple services in a multi-tenant hybrid cloud environment managed by multiple vendors. Can you let us know specifically, one, how IT for IT helps the CIO of company X manage the services better, how IT for IT helps vendors supporting company X to operate better, and which components of IT for IT bring multiple vendors and CIO onto a common view of the same page? I think this is a consulting question, actually. You cannot have it asked here. The <laughs> uh, thing is that, you, you know, it's a very interesting question, right? Now, what is the CIO organization going to do? What I see is that IT for IT is a flat model at this point in time, right? It talks about everything is a single plane, right? So if you take, for example, the S2P, right? That is strategy to portfolio that has some six components. Then you have your next six uh, and so on, right? Now the question is going to be that you can take each one of these components, you know, what is happening in a multi, multi, you know, multi ten, when you're talking multi ten, whatever you're talking about, let's say multi sourced environment for a simple word, right? So what is going to happen there is that each of these components will have a component, a piece of work which is done within the CIO organization and something that has to be owned by a service owner and something that has to be owned by a service pr provider or a component service provider. So IT variety can help you to track the flow through each of these things the same systematic manner. Today what is happening is that each one is in a silo like we talked about. So the Business organization is in a silo and the service provider organization also re exact replica of that silo, right? So what happens is that your CIO cannot really have the view, right? And when it becomes even in a single plane, when much of your thing is being done within the CIO organization, you don't have transparency. Now, when it's going across multiple places, you certainly don't have transparency. I can give you a lot of stories on that. So what IT for IT can do is it can help you look, okay, I take my strategy to portfolio. What am I going to do? What am I going to get somebody else to do? But the components are the same. So what it allows the CIO to do is to have a transparency of the service chain, right? Your, what we call as the, the data objects, right? There are two types of data objects in IT for IT. One is the service backbone object, which I showed you the purple colored ones. Right? They are containing the life cycle of the service. And then you have the other objects on the top. Right? These objects can be anywhere. Right? Uh, maybe uh, I think a good explanation of this I will be giving in, in an actual case study which may answer this in a much deeper way. Thank you. Do you have anything? No, nothing to add. Okay. Um, from a vendor perspective, is DevOps, Agile, and combined engineering and digitization, are they the methods to approach the three value chains of requirement to deploy, uh, request to deploy, request to f requirement to deploy, request to fulfill, and detect to correct? Are they the approaches? So I'll, I'll probably start. Now, if you're a vendor, what's the goal of a vendor? Is to make more business. So first, you understand what will sell you more and what will get it aligned, right? I mean, vendor, your tools, your whatever services that you give as a vendor is for profit basis, right? So first conducting whether aligning with DevOps or Agile or Kanban or whatever you call it across, is it a need? Yes, it's absolutely an imperative because one thing we have, we have been hearing right from morning is what are the tools that are going to facilitate IT for IT? So, when even in the start people want actually everything available, that's the same thing that we are getting in terms of DevOps. Look at, I'm not talking about, I'm not specific any vendor, but we have like Dockers, Puppet, Jenkins and all of this stuff, they are vendors. 
But if you look at that, they are providing the opportunity for continuous automation, continuous delivery, continuous integration, which is the concept of DevOps itself. Now, these principles that we have has got profound impact on automation. So that's where I think vendors play a significant role to, to realize the value chain. Because as you, at the end of the day, it's everybody plays a part in the whole pie. But if you don't get that uh, done at the appropriate time, the end value that is received by a customer is not achieved. So it's absolutely critical for the vendors who are in the market to understand the trends that are happening within the IT for IT, the value streams and how you can actually facilitate, which is one way you get a tick, check box and say, my tool is actually IT for IT certified, which enhances your opportunity to business. That's what Microsoft actually told. So I'm just quoting that reference. And I would say that the value streams basically prescribes a lot of latest concepts like the continuous integration, continuous development. So if you look at the R2D, the R2D has the concepts of DevOps, Agile, Waterfall and all that. So once a vendor certifies itself for R2D, he, it is mandatory for that vendor to follow, to, to align to those standards which it could either be DevOps or which could be Waterfall. Thank you. So there's some... There's some, the latest concepts are already built in into the reference architecture is the point I want to make. So a related from a, a question from a different perspective, from a service provider perspective, um, what's the, think of the IT department of a service provider, what's the value proposition for the CIO of a of service provider? I like the question. <laughs> well, I think it's very straightforward. Service providers are going to shut down if they don't change. <laughs> It's as simple as that, right? You, you look at your own businesses, right? How much money you are making, how many people you are hiring by the car loads, by the bus loads. You started building everything. Now what's happening? You got all mechanics, right? We know how to fix a problem. But what the customer is wanting is enough of fixing. Give me something new. Give me something different, right? Okay, so when we are talking from a service provider organization, I think there's a huge challenge as to what should be the role of the service provider within this kind of a disruptive environment, right, where there are, you know, basically two-speed IT running, right? So when you look at it, there is, there's, for the CIO of the, in fact, I just uh, did a piece of work for a customer, and you know what that the head said? is that we used to give vanilla services, vanilla ice cream. Now we can give chocolate sundae. Thanks for changing our delivery model, right? And it it can help you do that. Because you can tell your customer, as a broker, you do this, I will do this, right? So there is a very big opportunity for a complete change in engagement between the CIO organization and the service provider organization. Because the CIO has to move into a broker model, then who is going to do the integration story, right? So I think there are huge opportunities and huge challenges. But I think the opportunities are bigger. Thank you. So lastly, we're, we're out of time, but um, there were a number of questions about case studies. Are there case studies where this actually has been done um, that, that we can point people to? Now, clearly there are some on the Open Group site, um, and the Shell presentations give a, give a lot about that. Are there any that you're aware of that uh, you would specifically call out of IT for IT being used? So there's, there's a plug for uh, attend the IT for IT track this afternoon in here one. Um, Lakshmi, do you have Lakshmi? Yeah, so I think there was, Shell is something that I quoted. There was a large insurance company in UK called Delta Lloyd, and I think that case study is also there on the open group site. So these are the two that I am aware about. And since it is initial stages, we are in discussion with some companies. So uh, maybe over a period of time, you will get to know more case studies around IT for IT. I think one of the challenges that we have also is the customer doesn't want to reveal his names and, you know, the kind of thing. So, for example, the, you don't quote me again, uh, the telecom company that I mentioned across was specifically asking not to reveal the names or even a, you know, a tinge of it, which is understandable because they don't want to put them into a, you know, poor limelight. So, I think there's a lot of war stories and case studies available in someone's brain. So, I would say that the best way to get those things is to network and actually talk with people more than going through the site because you learn a lot by this attending this conference and some private discussions, which we can reveal a lot more information 
about a case study as opposed to do that. Absolutely. So to make sure we have enough time for that, we will stop the session and go to lunch so that people can talk to each other. Um, but uh, thank you all for your participation and thanks to the speakers this morning and the panel for a really good interactive session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.